When Kurt was young, the kids in Aberdeen and Montesano usually fell into three categories. The jocks, the rockers, and the misfits. Kurt fell somewhere between the latter two. Today, explain our young companions, there are still three distinct groups, only the qualifications are now different. You're either a screecher, pothead, a tweaker, crystal meth addict, or a junkie, heroin or crack addict. Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain, by Max Wallace and Ian Halperin, read by Media Gito. Video 2. We realize Donnie Collier is definitely a screecher, when the first thing he asks us is whether we have any of that good Canadian weed. Our new friends have brought us to meet Collier at his little house in North Aberdeen because he was supposedly real tight with Kurt. It soon becomes apparent that it wasn't so much Collier who was friends with Kurt, but rather his uncle Dale Crover, a member of a local band called the Melvins, and later a Nirvana drummer. Kurt had developed a love for pop music at an early age through listening to his favorite bands, the Beatles, the Mamas and the Papas, and the Monkees, on his Aunt Mary's old hi-fi. Despite or because of, his constant drum banging, none of his relatives had ever thought young Kurt had much musical affinity. Everybody just assumed he was going to be an artist after one of his drawings made it into the school paper when he was six. But, as he became increasingly alienated from his father's new family, music, not art, became his refuge. Don was into rock and roll in a big way, and he had joined the Columbia House Music Club, get 12 records for only a cent, When the records began to arrive, Kurt discovered a heavier sound than the bubblegum pop he had always loved. It soon brought him into contact with a new circle of friends, a group of much older heavy metal potheads who would come over to listen to and exchange records by the likes of Kiss, Aerosmith, and Black Sabbath. After they turned me on to that music, Kurt later recalled, I started turning into this little stoner kid. By the time he got his first guitar from his Uncle Chuck on his 14th birthday, Kurt had already decided he was going to be a rock star. When he began taking guitar lessons, he wanted to play only Led Zeppelin, recalls Warren Mason, the guitarist in Wendy's brother Chuck's band, who remembers the little blonde kid watching when we jammed. Mason still runs ads all over Aberdeen, inviting locals to study with the man who taught Kurt Copain... To play guitar. Chuck paid Mason $125 for an old Gibson Explorer and gave it to Kurt as a present. The first lesson, I asked Kurt if he could play anything, and he said yes, recalls Mason. He played Louie Louie on one string. Kurt later admitted the lo- Kurt later admitted that a lot of his songs were based on Louie Louie, which has a 1-4-5 chord progression. When I asked him his goal, he said he wanted to master Stairway to Heaven. His favorite band at the time was ELO. Years later, Kurt was furious when he read an interview with Mason and Rolling Stone, revealing Kurt's early love for Led Zeppelin and other mainstream bands. He was also pissed off that I said he was a nice kid, recalls Mason. Although bands like the Sex Pistols and the Ramones had already pioneered a musical revolution that would one day change his life, punk rock still had not permeated the Aberdeen scene. By the age of 15, unable to get along with Don's wife and his step-siblings, Kurt was shuttling back and forth between his parents' houses. But his mother's patience with his increasingly rebellious behavior grew thin, especially after Kurt was arrested for spray-painting homosexual sex rules on the side of a local bank an act more reflective of his penchant for pissing off the locals than of his sexual orientation. Wendy sent him to stay with a long series of relatives, including his grandparents, who brought him to church with them every Sunday. He didn't have much use for the sermons, recalls Leland, but he loved the music, and for a time Kurt even joined the choir, where he may have honed his soon-to-be distinct vocal abilities. And then at the age of 16, Kurt Cobain discovered punk, courtesy of a friend named Matt Lucan, whom Kurt had met in the most unlikely of places. They were on the same Little League baseball team that Kurt had joined to please his father, or so he later claimed, lest anybody accuse him of being a jock. 
Matt was the basis for a local band mockingly named after a mentally handicapped Thriftway employee called Melvin, who liked to climb on roofs. The year before, Kurt had been in the same high school art class as the Melvin's leader, Buzz Osborne, when the band had still been a Jimi Hendrix The Who cover band. But in the interval, the band had been turned on to the angry, rebellious sounds of punk, just the right music to say fuck off to all those they had grown to detest. The local rednecks, the jocks, the stoners, and most of all, their parents. Luke and Osborne began to lend Kurt their precious cachet of punk and new wave tapes, along with their most prized possession, a Sex Pistols photo book. Before long, he had joined the other Klingons, the nickname for the assortment of local misfits who congregated around the Melvins at the Aberdeen rehearsal space where the band pounded out the music that would transform Kurt's world. This is what I was looking for, Kurt wrote in his journal after he saw the band play for the first time behind the local thriftway. I came to the promised land of a grocery store parking lot, and I found my special purpose. Twenty years later, Donnie Collier, nephew of Dale Crover, the Melvin's drummer, takes a long hit off his pipe and proceeds to share his memories of Kurt, whom he met at the Melvin's sessions. There was a bunch of us who'd go over after school when the band rehearsed and just hang out. Sometimes he'd jam with the band, but he still wasn't very good. They didn't pay very much attention to him, I don't think. But they were the coolest guys in town, and anybody who hung around with them was automatically considered cool. At least we thought so. I think it's about the only place where Kurt really fit in. You always read that Kurt was really quiet, but I never really noticed that. There was this nerdy guy, Scotty Karate who would come over and hang out all the time. Kurt would sort of pick on him, just rag on him constantly. He could be a bit of a bully. He was pretty nice to me, though, because my uncle was in the band. He used to sell me pot. Kurt wasn't a big-time dealer or anything, but he'd always have a little extra that he'd sell to make some money. Collier has run out of the homegrown he had been using to fill the pipe that's been going around the room for the past 20 minutes. He offers to take the lot of us to Kurt Cobain Bridge, so a nickname because Kurt immortalized it in the heartbreaking song Something in the Way, and would later claim to have slept under it when his mother threw him out of the house. Recent accounts, fueled by the denials of Kurt's sister, Kim, have suggested the stories are a myth that Kurt never really slept under the bridge at all, but that he had embellished the stories to make his youth seem more unhappy. Nah, the only myth is that it was the Wishka Bridge he slept under, explains Collier, referring to the massive bridge you have to cross to enter Aberdeen. You can't sleep under that bridge. The tide would wash you away. Instead, Collier takes us to a much smaller structure known as the North Aberdeen Bridge, and we climb down a path to the fetid Wishka River through thorny brambles and bushes to emerge on a spacious rocky slope sheltered by the span. Here's where he slept, says Collier, his words occasionally drowned out by the rumbling of the cars overhead. Just about every kid Aberdeen, just about every kid around Aberdeen ends up sleeping here one time or another. Anybody who says Kurt didn't sleep here doesn't know what they're talking about. It's dry, it's pretty warm, and you can pitch a tent. Kurt would spend a couple nights at a time under here whenever his mother threw him out. Then if it got too damp or miserable he'd end up sleeping on somebody's floor. But it's a good place to play guitar. The acoustics are perfect. One of the girls, Angela, who'd been with us all afternoon, tells us she slept under this bridge for five days in 1995 after her own parents banished her from the house. It was dry, but it wasn't very warm, she remembers. I froze my ass off. The remnants of a small cooking fire and an abandoned sleeping bag suggest that somebody has indeed been sleeping here in the not-too-distant past. But it isn't the only sign of human activity. Judging by the graffiti adorning every available inch of the concrete columns, walls, and ceilings, we aren't the first to make the pilgrimage under this bridge in search of Kurt's ghost by the banks of the Wishka. Everything I ever knew I learned from Nirvana. Thank you, Kurt! scribbled one fan. Kurt lives, another had spray-painted. Among the hundreds of sentiments paying homage to their musical hero, we immediately noticed the same three-word graffito 
who killed Kurt, sprayed, painted, and scrawled like a nagging whisper from at least ten different locations. Donnie Collier, however, doesn't give much credence to the murder theories. When I knew him, he certainly didn't seem like the kind of guy who would end up killing himself, but who knows what happened after he left here. He shrugs. Nothing would surprise me about that world, but I doubt if he was murdered. I guess he just couldn't take it anymore. Autumn, the young mother, weighs in. Who wouldn't want to kill themselves growing up here? It rains all the time and there's nothing to do. He was a junkie and junkies die here practically every day. It's so common the paper doesn't even bother reporting it anymore. She is holding the baby in her arms so that he doesn't accidentally step on a dirty syringe, she says. But we don't see any needles, just a lot of cigarette butts and a few beer bottles. Why do you stay here? we ask. Do you ever dream of escaping? She looks incredulous before responding meekly. Where would I go? As we emerge from under the bridge, the kids ask us if we want to meet Kurt's daughter. This is an odd question since Kurt's daughter, Frances Bean, is 11 years old and is known to live in Los Angeles. No, he has an illegitimate daughter by a local girl that he slept with when he still lived here, Angela claims. She looks just like him, and she used to say all the time that Kurt was her dad. Most people think it's true. Skeptical, we decline the invitation. After we drop them off downtown and shell out some cash so the kids can each get a 40, we head to a local bar where we had been told we could hook up with the one person left in Aberdeen who might be able to shed light on how Kurt himself eventually escaped from this sad, seemingly dead-end existence. Six nights a week, each evening in a different location, Dave Reed organizes what appears to be the chief source of entertainment in these parts, karaoke. We arrive at Trio's bar, where the night's program is already well underway. As low-brow as the surroundings appear, one thing strikes us immediately. The people here are having fun. The first indication since we arrived that not everybody in this town considers it a redneck backwater devoid of culture. As an overweight middle-aged woman finishes screeching an out-of-town version of brown-eyed girl. The room erupts with cheers and encouragement. <clears throat> a fifty-something man sporting a purple tie-dyed t-shirt and a long beaded braid, almost to his waist, adjusts the mic. This is Dave Reed, the man who is said to have been like a father to Kurt Cobain during his latter teenage years. By 1984, when he was 17, Kurt had already experienced frequent and extended bouts of homelessness, living for months at a time in alleys, under bridges, and in friends' garages. His mother had taken up with a new boyfriend, a heavy-drinking, womanizing, hot-tempered longshoreman named Pat O'Connor, whom Kurt despised, and she didn't want anything to do with her son. He tried living with his father for a few months, but things were no better than before. Kurt had recently made friends with a boy named Jesse Reed, the teenage son of evangelical Christians, and began a period of his life that would not be anxious, that he would not be anxious to discuss in later years. One would be hard pressed to find any evidence in his soul bearing lyrics or soon to be frequent interviews about his Aberdeen youth that Kurt Cobain had found Jesus, become a born again Christian, and had even been baptized at the age of seventeen. Among the chroniclers dissecting the evolution of his drug use, few noted that he had spent a portion of his teenage years lecturing friends about the evils of drugs as an abomination against Christ. It was during this period that Dave Reed and his wife, Ethel, invited Kurt to live with their family at the Reed's large home a few miles outside Aberdeen. His family life was a mess, recalls Reed, who was also a Christian youth counselor at the time. He had big problems with his mother, and he was going through a really bad time. He and my son were always together, so I asked him if he wanted to stay with us. He jumped at the chance. I think Kurt saw me as a Ned Flanders type guy, although I don't think the Simpsons were even airing yet. I was with the South Aberdeen Baptist Church. 
Kurt became a born-again Christian through my son Jesse and our family environment. He went to church almost every time the door was open. I was a youth group leader, and Kurt would always come to church with Jesse. Firstly, he was into art, horses, and music. By this time, Kurt had dropped out of high school and entered what he would later call his aimless years. For hours on end, he would sit in the local library, reading voraciously, or writing the poems that would eventually form the lyrics to many familiar Nirvana songs. Hilary Rickrod, the reference librarian at Aberdeen's Timberland Library, recalls Kurt coming every day and reading for hours at a time. It was hard to miss him. He usually had multicolored hair, and that kind of stuck out in a little town like Aberdeen. The most significant byproduct of his church-going period was Kurt's burgeoning friendship with a gawky teenage giant named Krist Navaselic, who attended the same church as the Reeds. Kurt and Chris had met in high school, but it was while attending the Baptist church, which Chris joined because he was dating a Christian girl at the time, that they had actually bonded, says Reed. Jesse Reed, who was also a musician, invited Chris over one day to jam with him and Kurt. You could say that the roots of Nirvana began in our house, says the elder Reed, himself a former musician who had played in a group called the Beachcombers with Kurt's uncle Chuck. Kurt was really into his music. He practiced all the time and he was writing a lot of songs. He wanted to be a star. He said it all the time. A former member of the Beachcombers had gone on to become a promo man for Capitol Records in Seattle, and after Kurt learned of Reed's connection, he became obsessed with meeting the executive and launching a music career. Before long, Kurt's flirtation with Christianity waned. He resumed smoking pot, and an indignant Dave Reed eventually threw him out when Kurt broke a window one night after he lost his key but a small miracle had happened while he was there. Kurt began to believe that he could get out of Aberdeen and that his escape route might be rock and roll. Before long, he and Chris had formed a band with a drummer friend named Aaron Burkhart, rehearsing constantly in a room above the downtown beauty salon operated by Chris' mother. By the end of our weekend in Kurt's hometown, we had come no closer to determining whether the rejection and alienation of his dysfunctional youth had led inexorably to his self-demise. To each person we interviewed who had known him when he was young, we posed the question. Each in turn said they saw no real signs of self-destruction, but blamed whatever happened after he left, perhaps unwilling or unable to indict the community to which they still clung with the exception of Kurt's first guitar teacher, Warren Mason, who said he just couldn't see himself doing that at that point in his life, none doubted that he had killed himself. Dave, Dave Reed tells us to look elsewhere if we ever hope to make sense of Kurt's death, saying it was his fame that killed him. <clears throat> All right, welcome back to Media Gtow. If you like this video, go ahead and click uh, thumbs up like now. So, I don't think I've said this in this take, because I've done a couple takes. I really, re reading is hard, you guys. All right. Um, but I want to apologize for the audio in the last video, because I didn't have a, a pop screen. See, I can say pop, pop, pop. It's not going to blow your ears out in the last video. And if this one's a little bit too quiet, well, you can go ahead and turn it up on your little device there. But you cannot reduce volume when it's too loud. But you can always turn up volume if it's too quiet. If you do any audio production, you'll understand what I'm saying. So hopefully the quality is better for you this time. Now, secondly, Merry Christmas. Okay. Third, um, that was a lot of reading really have much to say. Sometimes it's nice to just read. So Wallace and Halperin are in Aberdeen investigating, asking the locals. Now, counter-argument. Um, it's just two guys going around asking townies, media g -tow. It doesn't, this doesn't prove anything. And in fact, as the authors here just stated, everyone still thinks that he killed himself. Get more center there? Sorry. All right. All the townies still think that he killed himself. So, <laughs> I'm only laughing not because burping's so funny, 
but because I'm trying real hard not to to spike and blow you out, and then I just burped in your face. <laughs> These guys are going around town asking everyone, oh, you know, what do you think happened? Like, uh, we fucking think he killed himself, you dumb fucks. Okay. You know, um... By the way, I'm so distracted. I, I, even though the audio quality is better on this one, hopefully, as I'm fucking with my mic, uh, this other computer I'm working with right now, it keeps freezing. And so if there's ever been any lapses during this video where there's skipped audio, I apologize for that too. All right, Mediagito, get your audio shit straight. You wonder why no one listens. Hey, I'm on a real mic this time, okay? We're moving up in the world. So... Now I'm really self-conscious because I feel like I'm wasting your time. Oh, fuck you. Kurt Cobain had always wanted to be famous. That was the one thing virtually everybody we talked to in his hometown agreed on. But when he finally got his wish in 1991, it was and wasn't what he'd expected. He finally escaped Aberdeen for good in 1987, shortly after his 20th birthday. He had moved to the state capital, Olympia, 30 miles up the road, to live with his first serious girlfriend, Tracy Miranda, and discovered what would later be described as his spiritual mecca, the ultra-hip college town where the Bohemians actually outnumbered the rednecks. By the time Kurt moved to Olympia, the band he and Chris had formed in Aberdeen had already played a few gigs, under a number of incarnations, including Skid Row, Ted, Ed, Fred, and Fecal Matter. They were beginning to attract a small following. When he wasn't practicing his music, Kurt continued to dabble in art, creating surreal landscapes covered with fetuses and mangled animals or memorably a collage of photos of diseased vaginas that he'd found in medical textbooks. With money Kurt saved from a part-time janitorial job, the band was able to record a demo at the studio of a former Navy engineer named Jack Indino who was impressed by Kurt's distinctive vocals and the band's hard-edged sound. And Dino passed the demo to a friend named Jonathan Poneman, the head of a new Seattle indie label called Sub Pop. Around this time, the band finally... Band, around this time, the band finally settled on a permanent name. The story goes that Kurt had discovered Buddhism after watching a TV show about Eastern religions and was enchanted by the idea of transcending the cycle of human suffering. He especially liked the name the Buddhists gave to the concept of ultimate enlightenment, nirvana. By this time, he had also discovered a new drug. Since he was a teenager, Kurt had experienced intermittent stomach pains that would send him into paroxysms of agony without any warning. He saw an endless series of medical specialists, but doctors were at a loss to explain what was causing the problem, which he later described to Details magazine. Imagine the worst stomach flu you've ever had, every single day. And it was worse when I ate, because once the meal would touch that red area, I would hyperventilate, my arms would turn numb, and I would vomit. He had been offered heroin on a number of occasions, but he had always refused, in part because he was afraid of needles. For the most part, he still confined his drug use to pot, percodin, and magic mushrooms. By the time he moved to Olympia, the stomach pain was unbearable. A local heroin dealer called Grunt told him that opiates were the ultimate painkiller. Chris Navaselic who was himself battling alcoholism at the time, later recalled telling Kurt he was playing with dynamite after Kurt called to tell him he had just done heroin for the first time. Yeah, he did it a few times back then because he said it was the only thing that could get rid of the pain, confirms Kurt's best friend Dylan Carlson, whom he met in Olympia and who was himself a junkie. But it wasn't a habit or anything, at least not back then. Okay, okay. Authors are changing the subject now here. And so we're going to have to talk about this a little bit. Um, so they're talking about the whole stomach pain right now. Buzz Osborne, these authors mentioned the Melvins and Kurt's friendship 
with the Melvins, as well as Chris, as Chris. And Buzz Osborne says the stomach thing was just total bullshit, a fabrication, a lie made up by Kurt in order to justify drug use. Because as it says here, doctors were at a loss to explain what was causing the problem. Now, I don't know about most, but a lot of the times doctors can figure out what's going on. The fact that none of them... Now, this is Kurt's word. Did Kurt's parents accompany him to these appointments? What is their comments on the stomach thing? Um... Kurt says, It was worse when I ate because once the meal would touch that red area, I would hyperventilate, my arms would turn numb, and I would vomit. Okay. So stomach pains that where he can't eat, so he can just never eat? I don't know. I really don't know what to think. If this was a lie, it was a bold one, and it was a long-term lie. So allegedly, he does heroin for the first time, according to Kurt himself. Because of this stomach pain. Um, then, then it says, Chris Novoselic, who was himself battling alcoholism at the time. Uh, Chris has been a drunk ever since this period. Did Chris get sober? I don't know. He sure doesn't look like it. He's, he's definitely been through enough to, to deserve how he looks, which is basically haggard and older. I don't know. Father Time has his way with us all. With us all, I suppose. Me to Jeets, I'll take a second here, man. You're distracted. All right. Okay. Everyone alleging that he did it for the first time to get rid of the stomach pain. And Kurt tells Chris, Chris says, you're playing with dynamite, man. Okay. Things were looking up. When Kurt heard that Sub Pop had agreed to record the band's first single, Love Buzz, he ran into the streets yelling, I'm going to be a rock star, Nirvana rules! An album followed, titled Bleach, after the substance junkies employ to clean their needles so they can be reused. Okay, okay, we have to pause. You'll notice, guys, guys and gals, um, I'll read for a long stretch, and then there's some times, and I'll, I'll consciously... Yeah, there's a reason you're distracted when you're doing audio as well as commentary and recording it and whatever. Uh, I'm not trying to give myself credit here. It's, and then on top of that, I feel like I have to sit here and freaking dance for you. All right, I understand that we live in a total ADD generation. Just think of all these things as a live stream. And there you go. Just think of it as your chance to have some silence as we read together. But we have to consciously start expanding and lengthening our attention spans. I'm guilty as everybody else. If I get bored by a video, if I am not into it, I can just change on a dime, something I was interested in 10 minutes ago. If the content is not presented well enough, or if I just see a shiny thing, I'm somewhere else, baby. I'm gone. All right? I'm not only imploring you to not do that just because I want... Sure, of course I want your freaking viewership, listenership. All right? And I know I said a lot of things last video about I'm not going to do more of these unless you start engaging as well. I mean, that's valid. If you if you watch videos and you like them, you should like them. Not just mine, but you need to support the content creators. All right? And sometimes I won't give the like on a video <clears throat> because the video is not good enough. But I do, I am entertained, but I don't give the like. Um, sometimes I just forget. So I need to get better at it as well. Now, I, so I know I said all that stuff last video. Moods change. All right. I've got better audio quality going on. I'm just going to keep on rolling. So the reason that I'm pausing here, though, at this point, 1987, 1988, Kurt is already so fascinated with uh, heroin that he names their first album Bleach. And I quote, after the substance junkies employ to clean their needles so they can be reused. All right. And at this time, he has already done heroin for the first time. He has already played with dynamite, as Chris would say, due to this stomach thing, I guess. But everyone's looking for an excuse to do drugs. Okay. If heroin is the only thing in the entire world that numbs this stomach pain, it's somehow justifiable. 
uh, okay, whatever. I don't even know what to say to that. You, you do have to be, um, you do have to dance on that line to do heroin for the first time. Now, I've done heroin. I smoked it. This is years back. But I've never shot it. And I, I don't know how Kurt even got over his fear. Do they say here? His fear of needles. I don't know. Yeah, it's just, it's fucking stupid. So, yeah, he brought his addiction on himself from the first. Stomach pain, if it's true, <clears throat> yeah, I, I feel bad for the guy. How is it possible that they could never figure out? I don't think he tried everything. Um, I, I'm not trying to blame the victim here. But the fact that Buzz Osborne is saying that the stomach pain is not true is totally a lie. Uh, that's controversial. This is one of Kurt's best friends, at least before he met, um, well, Chris and then Dylan Carlson and stuff. But to me, it just sounds like an excuse. Two things can be true, guys. Bleach was recorded for a grand total of $606.17 at Indino's studio. By this time, the struggling Sub Pop co-founders, Jonathan Poneman and Bruce Pavitt, already deep in debt, had decided that if the Seattle Sound, or grunge as it would soon be known, was going to find a wider audience, it would, need, it would be necessary first to create a buzz in the UK. That's how Seattle's most famous rock and roll descendant, Jimi Hendrix, had first made a name for himself two decades earlier. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, so, and that's still, I think, um, a lot of times bands will break in the UK first. And we see with this very interesting case, this guy Jared Threaten fabricated uh, likes and fans um, in order to get a little UK tour. And if you haven't heard about this by now, just YouTube jared threaten t-h-r-e-a-t-e-n um so i don't know what he thought he was doing because by the time he and his band got over and were playing these clubs and literally no one was in the audience you've got all these fake fans in order to get the tour in the uk and then no one coming to your show so obviously the jig was going to be up very clearly and quickly totally apropos of nothing no never mind never mind you don't get to hear my <laughs> spurgy thoughts so, yeah, it's it still often happens that you got to... So a lot of times bands will still... I think that's the current model, 2019. Um, a lot of times bands will break in the UK before making it big in the US. You know, They are your, your tastemakers. Um, but in which genres, I couldn't really tell you. you. You'll often be appreciated over there more than you will here. I'm not sure why that is. I'm, I'm honestly not sure why that is, so... In the United States, alternative music was still a fringe movement confined to college radio stations and seedy clubs. The sub-pop founders were determined to change that, borrowing money to fly in Everett True of the influential London music magazine Melody Maker to showcase their label's talent. They couldn't possibly have imagined how much this gambit would pay off. True would later become known as the godfather of grunge for his series of articles profiling sub-pop in the burgeoning Seattle music scene. It may even have been True's seal of approval that started the train rolling for Nirvana, which he described in an article as the real thing. No rock star contrivance, no intellectual perspective, no master. Kurt Cobain is a great tunesmith, although still a relatively young songwriter. He wields a riff with passion. The music press descended on the city to see what all the fuss was about, and grunge, as the local music paper The Rocket described it, in a regional scene to become a worldwide fashion craze. The mainstream music industry began to pay attention. A&R reps swept through town, cash and contracts in hand, looking to capitalize on what everyone was sure was the next wave in music. Although a number of critics were decidedly unimpressed with Bleach, Rolling Stone described it as undistinguished, relying on warmed-over 70s riffs. Others declared Cobain a genius. Kurt was loving every second of it, recalls his best friend Dylan, himself a struggling musician. He kept saying they were going to be bigger than the Beatles. Everybody knew they were getting signed, and believe me, they were getting off on it. When you dream of being a rock star and it finally happens, I guess nothing really beats it.
A lot of this is table setting. What's going on with my audio? Check, check, one, two. A lot of this is table setting, and I feel like it's repeating content, I am sure, even though I wouldn't be able to remember. Because when you're reading things, you're just accessing this weird part of your brain that uh, you're not even really thinking, you know, when you're reading aloud. And so this other part of your brain is thinking, oh, what do I actually think about this? Is the audio going well, etc. But I do think that I read some of this stuff, similar, you know, background, in Heavier Than Heaven. I'm sure that I did. So it is table setting, it's background, and the authors are going to continue with this. Now, there, there still is interesting stuff here. Bleach, uh, About a Girl, Negative Creep, School, those are the good songs, you know. I mean, with retrospect, everything is clear. Um, what are you trying to say? I don't know. I'm going to have to stop this video. I'm too distracted. Come back. All right, so what we're going to do actually is uh, have this be a bit of a short video because chapter one is almost up. So we'll take our time. We'll come in just under uh, 50 minutes here. But yeah, I mean, okay, let's quote Dylan. He kept saying they're going to be the biggest thing. Or they're going to be bigger than the Beatles. Uh, so Kurt, Kurt's going around bragging about this. So any anyone who's saying that he never wanted success, he hated it, etc. Now that may have been after he got what he wanted, and it probably was. Okay, be careful what you wish for. Uh, but before he was very ambitious. He went out of his way. He was trying to get signed, and so I just feel that uh, it's disingenuous that he never wanted success. And I don't even know that Kurt would say that. I, I think that that's more of a framing of the narrative by the media at the time all right he never wanted to be big and yet they somehow struck it big it's like did you not intend to record the album and release it uh, he was very aware of the campaign behind nevermind i mean we'll get there right now we're still at bleach and the uk and everett true and you know they're, they're picking it up they like it no rock star contrivance but aside from something like about a girl uh, you really can't tell what kind of songwriter cobain is at this point now, we're, we're getting back into heavier than heaven, you know, Nirvana biography territory. These guys, the authors, are setting the stage and the table here. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, aside from my... Not aside. One thing I'm going to do differently in this audiobook is I'm, I'm not going to edit for content at all. I'm going to read the entire thing. That's why this is going to be the biggest project I've ever done. And um, the thing will probably clock in at about 30 hours. So about 30 videos. When you go and get... Um, let's see. See? Someone texted me. Fucking distracting. That's why I'm in this video. But let's see. Oh, when you go get an audiobook, right? If it's worth a shit, it's going to be 30, 35 hours. All right? And if you're anything like me, which is to say kind of nerdy, um, yeah, that's that's interesting. That's what you want. You want that kind of content to chew on. So let's see. I'm going to pause real quick. All right. I apologize for the distraction. Just think of it as a live stream. And, uh, well, we have fun together, ladies and gentlemen. It's a lot more fun for me when I take the pressure off myself and just say, fuck it. Have fun. Let's read. I don't owe you shit. Merry Christmas. Now, fortunately, the authors here are skipping past some of the table setting stuff. So let's finish up the chapter. I mean, it is chapter one. They're getting it out of the way. When Nevermind, Nirvana's second album, vaulted past Michael Jackson's Dangerous in December 1991 to occupy number one on the Billboard charts, music journalists scrambled for an explanation. How could a supposedly alternative band sell three million albums in four months? A year earlier, the band had signed an unprecedented deal with Geffen Records that gave Nirvana complete creative control. It wasn't the million-dollar advance that other labels were offering, but Kurt and his bandmates were ecstatic. They had been spared the noose of corporate rock they all feared when the majors came courting following the explosion of the Seattle music scene during the late 1980s. They would be able to make the kind of album they wanted to make, not the overproduced commercial crap they had so often scorned, at least in the company of their indie rock friends. They could hand in a 60-minute tape of the band defecating, and Geffen would have to release it, Kurt joked. 
when they actually what they actually did instead was go into the studio and record an inspired punk ode to the band's pop roots, an album that would soon be recognized as a masterpiece. It still sounded like noise to most people over 30, the feedback and hard-driving guitar drowning out the catchy musical bridges, until you listened closely enough. We got more attention than other alternative bands because our songs have hooks and they kind of stick in people's minds, said Kurt, attempting to explain the album's success. Indeed, each member of Nirvana claimed the Beatles as his favorite group, and it showed. But it was the lyrics on top, on topics as daring and diverse as rape and religious zealotry that tapped into the angst of an American youth alienated by a decade of Republicans in the White House and the recently fought Gulf War, which some theorize readied a generation for the rebellion of alternative music. The angry, culture-shifting single, Smells Like Teen Spirit, played ad nauseum on rock radio and MTV, was instantly hailed as the anthem of Generation X and Cobain its voice. This was music by, for, and about a whole new group of young people who had been overlooked, ignored, or condescended to wrote Michael Azarad. Okay. Even though we're wrapping up the chapter, we do have to comment on that. So if you can, ladies and gentlemen, put yourself in a place of 1991, maybe you were there, as some of us were. Um, the Republican 80s are, you know, 1980 uh, all the way to 88, and then George Bush Sr. is elected. So we've got, you know... At this point, 11 years of Republicans in office. Now, this would be like, well, gosh, what was Gerald Ford? I don't know, you guys, but that, that is a long time. Think about how different that is. All right, now, some of you are going to argue, oh, well, Trump's in office, etc. But the fact is, Trump probably won't even get reelected. So you've got your wish right there. So congratulations, liberals. I mean, you've owned this fucking country, uh, well, since Obama. I'm not even going to get there. I'm not even going to go there. Um, but if you can put yourself in this position of being a rebellious Gen Xer who feels stifled by Republicanism and, you know, was I of conscious age? Did I feel this way? Did I know how it felt in 1991? Uh, I don't know. Clearly not. Let's just say that. I maybe was not of the age to be so rebellious. Okay. To be so rebellious and want to escape these Reagan 80s. I may not even understand how it felt because I've been so indoctrinated by liberalism. And in the early 90s, we had liberals trying to break free to actually um, have a voice. This was the beginning of political correctness. We were coming out of AIDS um, and crack, crack babies, uh, Reaganomics, all right, elitism. Um, the 80s... You know, it was good times, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. But what it wasn't was like some kind of liberal bastion. Now, of course, oh, media gita, you had women's lib in the 1970s, which would only go on to gain strength in the 80s. Sure, but it's been said that the 80s was like the last time of love. People still believed in traditional values in the 80s, and the two parties were kind of in harmony, believe it or not. All right. Now, what they're telling you is that there was this underclass of rebellious kids just wanting to be liberal and that Cobain and Nirvana gave them that permission, gave them that avenue in order to emerge into this culture. And they'd been so oppressed and they were just boiling with like antipathy and fucking uh, and that smells like teen spirit specifically was the vehicle for this collective rage. How much of that is true? Mm, I think it's been overstated, just like many things in history, all right? Uh, my experience during that time is that people pretty much got along and it wasn't so fucking political, all right? This was at least the beginning of political correctness. Now, sure, women's lib, there weren't language fucking Nazi police all on your ass during the 80s, all right? They just weren't. And if anything, um, it was a very anti-gay sentiment, in the 1980s. So a certain element, I'm not going to say of liberalism, of progressivism, but a certain element of inclusivity may have been necessary in the 80s. All right? 
uh, but we obviously took it way too far. Now this book is making the case that, you know, Nirvana was necessary. Basically, Nirvana was liberal. <laughs> and it they definitely were. Okay? Two things, guys. Two things. Still, this kind of success wasn't supposed to happen. Had Nirvana sold out? It was a question being asked by many of Kurt's old punk rock friends, and he was acutely sensitive to it. He had a simple explanation. We didn't go to the mainstream. The mainstream came to us. Later, he would tell interviewers that he hated the album, that it was the kind of album he himself would never listen to, and that it was too slick-sounding. But the poppy hooks were no accident. Nirvana had unstinting creative control over Nevermind. Kurt's entourage, who knew he listened to his favorite album, Abba Gold, Greatest Hits, almost constantly while touring, were well aware just how absurd his protestations were. Well, yes, absolutely, and I'm not sure if the authors are going to get into it, but when Kurt went on to claim that the production and the mix by Andy Wallace on Nevermind was too slick-sounding, things like this, it's bullshit. You had complete fucking creative control. What, you couldn't have changed the mix? Absolute bullshit. You thought it was too slick. Uh, as he says here, he hated, you know, he hated the album. It's the kind of album he himself would never listen to. Uh, then why did you release it that way? Why did you record it? You know, it just screams whiny to me. The most ironic byproduct of the album's success was the acquisition of a brand new fan base, largely consisting of what Kurt would describe as the stump dumb rednecks that I thought we had left behind in Aberdeen. Well, interruption. You don't get to choose your fan base, all right? Um, you put something out there to the masses, that's exactly who's going to pick it up. The thing you thought was cool and rebellious is now being bought by the, the Big Mac Abercrombie or football player meat hit crowd that used to kick your ass. You should have been able to predict that. So when you when Kurt looked out on the crowd and there were a bunch of people they fucking hated rocking to songs that, you know, he wrote about them and hating them, yeah, that's that's a tough that's some cold lotion, baby. Indeed, the crowds of the band's sold-out concerts were almost in indistinguishable from the fans at a Guns N' Roses concert. So alarming was this turn of events that Kurt would use the liner notes of his next album to warn the homophobes, the racists, and the misogynists in Nirvana's audience to leave us the fuck alone. I'm trying to wrap up this chapter, and they're just giving me too much good stuff. You know, It's tough. It's a tough call, right? So Kurt didn't like homophobes, racists, and misogynists. All right, well, um, that implies that we're supposed to love all gays, even though being gay is unnatural. Uh, racism I surely and certainly don't agree with. Okay, that's one I'll give him. Misogyny, um, people weren't really misogynists then or ever. <laughs> There was not some big woman-hating movement going on in the 90s. As much as uh, Kathleen Hanna from Bikini Kill and her little documentary, what is it, The Punk Singer, her whole thing and her book, Girls to the Front, that was her whole little thing, right? Oh, girls keep getting pushed around at punk shows. They keep getting beaten up. Let's have all the girls at the front. Everyone bring the girls up front. Come on. Yeah, as she's fucking flashing her sexy little ass. And tits. Oh, and that reminds me of this woman, Mia Zapata, who was murdered. That sucks. It truly does. But what did she do to get murdered? Am I blaming the victim? Well, a little bit, sure. You gotta be out there in the first place. So anyway, uh, the hypocrisy of uh, Kathleen Hanna's little girl power movement. And yeah, I mean, that's what it was, right? The album that Kurt wrote, and I've said this many times in my Kurt projects, um, Nirvana was about Toby Vale, who was the leader of this riot girl movement. Kurt was aware of the irony, right? Because she went on to use his name to catapult to fame, or at least to become notorious. Oh, I'm the guy, I'm the girl who fucked Kurt Cobain. I'm the girl who Nevermind is about, <clears throat> right? That was her whole thing. Um, he was aware that he was being exploited. You know, if Kurt had lived, he probably would have ended up becoming a Republican. 
As if to underscore Leland's claim that his mother didn't have any use for Kurt until he became famous, Wendy wrote a letter to the local Aberdeen paper. Shortly after Nevermind hit the charts, sounding like a doting mother whose son had just left the nest for the first time. Kurt, if you happen to read this, we are so proud of you. And you truly are one of the nicest sons a mother could have. Please don't forget to eat your vegetables or brush your teeth. And now that you have your mind, uh, now that you have your maid, make your bed. The irony wasn't lost on Kurt, who was struck by the hypocrisy of the sudden attention from Wendy and his other relatives, most of whom who wanted nothing to do with him only a few months earlier. He left Aberdeen and his family behind for good. And no amount of sucking up would make him forget two decades of rejection. At the height of his band's success, Kurt clearly identified with his favorite Beatle, John Lennon, who knew as well as anybody the price of fame. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Kurt talked about this bond with Lennon. I don't know who wrote what parts of Beatles songs, but Paul McCartney embarrasses me. Lennon was obviously disturbed. I just felt really sorry for him. His life was a prison. He was imprisoned. It's not fair. That's the crux of the problem that I've had with becoming a celebrity, the way people deal with celebrities. The next chapter in Cobain's short life was to invite new comparisons between himself and his musical idol. When George Harrison was first asked how he met Yoko Ono, when George Harrison was asked how he first met Yoko Ono, he replied, I'm not sure. All of a sudden she was just there. Kurt's bandmates, Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic, would tell similar stories in later years about the bleached blonde who started to appear at Kurt's side shortly after Nevermind was released. Perhaps that's why Grohl and Novoselic both called her Yoko, at least behind her back. End of chapter one. And we're going to reach our little 55-minute mark. So, um, Dave and Chris are calling her Yoko, clearly. Now, as much as I bemoaned all the background table setting stuff, all of a sudden, he spends, the author spent all this time on Bleach and how that kind of made Nirvana's name, and then they completely gloss over Nevermind, or just like, and then he started dating Courtney, and she was at her side. She just kind of popped out of nowhere, and she was Yoko. So, but let's look at this last part, right? Kurt's already well aware of the trappings of fame, um, he's always loved the Beatles. The Beatles is his favorite band. And, you know, Chris and Dave also go on to say that the Beatles were, can you be a little less original though? For Christ's sake. Um, okay. So Kurt is well aware of the trappings of fame and uses John Lennon kind of as a template, as a cautionary warning tale for what not to do and the trappings of fame. And of course, John Lennon, is killed on December 8th, I believe, 1980. Um, you know, that is the ultimate price of fame. So Kurt is well aware of the trappings of this. And yet he goes on um, to willingly become famous. So I don't have much more to say about this one. Uh, hopefully the audio was better for you guys. And now that Courtney is in the picture, um, now hopefully the authors aren't going to gloss over this. Let's just see like in regards to how they met. Hmm. Sorry. Okay. So they begin the next chapter, and I'm not going to read it now, but when we set out to interview those who might offer us the best insight into the real Courtney love. Okay, okay. Oh, no, no. And then the first time Kurt spotted Courtney... All right, all right. So chapter two... Um, we're really going to get into that meeting. Now, I have reviewed this material so much that I feel like I've already read this book to you guys. Do you ever get deja vu? But at the same time, they're going to get into how... You can't blame Courtney for everything. Kurt was a willing participant in all of these things. And they're going to get into how he really fucked himself, for lack of a, a better term. So, a table-setting episode for sure which always occurs around these audiobooks, around chapter one or two, or video one or two. I want to thank you for listening. Um, yeah, you could probably expect more videos on this topic. And I want to say, if I don't talk to you, though, this has been Media Gito, and Merry Christmas. <laughs>